Thank you for joining me as I continue my examination of The Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel. In this video, I will be covering chapter 10, which is titled The Evidence of Consciousness, the Enigma of the Mind. So, Strobel begins this chapter by spending a, a lengthy first section, before he even gets to his interview, writing about consciousness and how many, quote, scientists and philosophers, unquote, now believe that the brain and the mind are two distinct things and that the human mind and human consciousness cannot be explained naturalistically. He brings up Ray Kurzweil's speculations about the future of artificial intelligence, only to dismiss the notion that any non-human intelligence could ever truly be conscious. And Strobel doesn't offer any specifics about why Kurzweil is wrong, why the idea of artificial consciousness is absurd. He quotes philosopher John Searle saying that increasing computing power can't lead to consciousness because all computers know how to do is shuffle symbols. And he quotes William Dembski accusing Kurzweil of peddling science fiction and bad philosophy. But then he just kind of leaves it there. He doesn't offer any specifics. And this subject comes up a bit later, as you'll see when he gets to his interview subject. And they don't really get any more specific there either, but just wait. Uh, so the mind the soul, the self, whatever you want to call it, being separate from the brain and essentially non-physical is cited as evidence, says Strobel, that naturalistic theories like Darwinian evolution can't explain everything about who we are, where we come from, and that there must have been a creator who made humankind. We must be intelligently designed. We must not be evolved beings, but created beings. Well, what evidence is there? For the mind being distinct from the brain and non-physical, Strobel cites Wilder Penfield, who is, or was rather, a renowned neurosurgeon who found that when he stimulated the motor cortex of epilepsy patients, it would cause one hand to move, but that the other, but that the patient was still able to move their other hand to grab onto the hand that moved because of the stimulus and to try and stop it from moving. And Penfield speculated that uh, this indicated that the patient had a physical brain that could cause an action when stimulated, but that there was also a non-physical mind that interacted with the brain but could not be controlled by manipulating the brain that was able to spring into action and cause the other hand to wrestle the, the stimulated hand back down. All due respect, to Dr. Penfield, he knew a lot more about how the brain works than I do. But is it not possible that while his stimulation of part of the brain caused one hand to move, the patient was still able to move the other hand by using another part of their brain? Isn't it kind of a leap to assume that there must be a completely non-physical mind just because someone was still able to move their other hand? I'm not familiar with the experiment being described, at least not in anything other than the most general sense. I haven't read anything about it or, or read the actual research. But from the description in the book, it sounds like an unwarranted conclusion, to say the least. To say, well, see this? This proves that there must be a non-physical mind as well as a physical brain. And also, Penfield died in the 1970s. And he retired from medicine and research, I believe, in the early 60s. So I wonder if Strobel or his interview subject will be discussing any more recent research into the brain and the mind and how that all works. I, I have an idea. I have a guess. But we'll see if I'm right. Uh, speaking of the interview, who has Strobel selected to inform him and us, his readers, about the intricacy of the workings of the human mind? Has he found an experienced neurosurgeon, a renowned neuroscientist. Actually, it's Christian apologist and favorite Strobel interview subject, J.P. Moreland, who has an undergrad degree in chemistry and a master's and a doctorate in philosophy. But he has an interest in issues relating to human consciousness. <laughs> 
says Strobel. So I guess it's fine that Strobel chose to interview this friend of his with no relevant education or experience to the topic at hand than an actual expert in the field of neuroscience or the study of human consciousness. It's completely fine. This is, this is a serious, objective, legitimate journalistic exercise, everybody. This book, Lee Strobel is a reporter chasing down a story, okay? And he doesn't want people to just tell him what he wants to hear. He's finding the best experts to answer his hard-hitting and probing questions. Just in case you think that this is something else, okay? Strobel begins the interview by asking Moreland to define consciousness, and Moreland offers that a simple definition might be that consciousness is what you're aware of when you introspect. It's the ability to have thoughts, sensations, emotions, desires, beliefs, to make choices, and to be aware of yourself and the world around you. That is consciousness. And what about the soul? Moreland defines that as the ego, the self, that which contains the consciousness. He says that consciousness is seated in the soul, not in the brain. And that's why when the soul leaves the body, Moreland says, the body becomes a corpse. He states this as though it is a scientific fact. Strobel does point out that Moreland is describing a religious belief. He says, after Moreland says, well, then so therefore when the corpse leaves the body, the body becomes a corpse. Strobel does think to say, well, that's according to Christian teaching or Christian belief. But that only invites Moreland to go into greater detail about that Christian belief, about the biblical understanding of the soul and its relationship to the body before and after death. He doesn't justify why he's appealing to a Christian belief. He doesn't give some scientific reason why that is the best understanding or the best explanation. He just says, yeah, you're right, that is a Christian belief that I'm describing, Lee, and here's some more about that Christian belief. Moreland tells Strobel that this mind-body dualism is not unique to Christianity, that the ancient Greeks had such a belief as well. However, the Greeks believed that the mind and the body were alien to each other, while Christians believe that the mind and the body are separate, but that they interact and cooperate with each other. But Strobel asks, what if dualism is not a valid model? What if the physicalists, those who believe that the consciousness is contained in the brain and not in a non-physical soul, what if, what if they're right? What if that's the valid theory, the correct explanation? Moreland offers three key implications, if that is in fact the case. First, consciousness wouldn't exist because there would be no such thing as conscious states that must be described from a first-person point of view. And he goes on, quote, You see, if everything were matter, then you could capture the entire universe on a graph. You could locate each star, the moon, every mountain, Lee Strobel's brain, Lee Strobel's kidneys, and so forth. That's because if everything is physical, it could be described entirely from a third-person point of view. And yet we know that we have first-person subjective points of view. So physicalism can't be true. The fact that you could theoretically create a map of where every particle of matter was and what it was doing at any given moment doesn't mean that consciousness is impossible. Consciousness itself is a product of what some of those particles are doing. Consciousness itself must still be experienced from a first-person perspective. Moreland doesn't explain why the ability to describe things from a third-person perspective negates the existence of the first-person experience. He just asserts it as though it's self-evidently true. But even better, he makes it kind of a circular argument. He says, if physicalism were true, there would be no first-person perspective. But we all have first-person perspectives, therefore physicalism can't be true. The second implication of physicalism, according to Moreland, is no free will. Why? Because matter behaves according to the laws of nature, which means that ultimately our decisions are made not by choice, but according to physical conditions. What appear to be our choices are actually fixed. Again, 
Not necessarily. Moreland seems to assume that if consciousness is rooted in the physical, a product of the physical, then it is indistinguishable from matter and is unable to do anything or produce any sort of result that is not directly determined by the laws of chemistry and physics. And I don't think that has to be the case. Consciousness can be generated by the brain, by the physical, by things that operate according to physical laws, but it can still be described and understood and experienced in ways other than simply reducing it to the simplest physical terms. Now, there are many people, philosophers, scientists, smart people, who do believe that free will is an illusion, that we don't actually make real meaningful choices. And there are others who hold the opposite view, who believe that free will is possible in a, in a physical universe. What I find interesting about Moreland listing it as a key implication of physicalism is that he seems to be making an appeal to consequences here. At least when he brought up the implication that first-person perspectives wouldn't exist, he was making an argument for why physicalism couldn't be true. It was a silly, shitty argument, but at least the idea was, hey, if physicalism is true, then this would be true, but since this isn't true, we know physicalism isn't true either. Here he's just saying, there would be no free will, and leaving it at that. Well, so? Moreland makes a bizarre, half-assed argument about the Vietnam War in an attempt to demonstrate that the mind is not contained in the brain. He talks about how the U.S. continuously bombed the North Vietnamese because the Johnson administration believed that people are just physical objects responding to stimuli. And if they were bombed often enough, eventually they would get the message and give in. But they didn't give in. They had beliefs and convictions and the ability to make free choices. In other words, they had souls. They were more than just physical brains, and they refused to give in. And that's why the Vietnam War took so long. What? Seriously, this is the expert on consciousness that Lee Strobel picked for his book? This guy? Where does Moreland even attempt to establish that things like conviction and beliefs and courage and the refusal to give in despite overwhelming opposition are impossible under a physicalist model? Nowhere, nowhere does he even attempt to establish those things. He once again just states it. He says, well, the Vietnamese didn't give up because they had souls. As though the fact that they didn't give up proves that people have souls. The brain being the foundation of the mind, consciousness being rooted in the physical, doesn't preclude people from acting counterintuitively or doing something unexpected or demonstrating courage or stubbornness or living according to convictions that they refuse to abandon even under incredible stress. Why does Moreland define those traits as only being possible if the mind is contained in a non-physical soul. On what basis does he define them that way? He doesn't say. At the end of the Vietnam section, Moreland says, we all know deep down inside. We know that we're more than just a physical brain, but that's not evidence. It's evidence that we're conscious, we have a sense of self-knowledge. We have thoughts. That's evidence of consciousness. But it's not evidence that our consciousness is not contained in our brains. That kind of a claim can't be verified or refuted simply by the sense of self-knowledge. The truth or falsehood of objective, empirical, testable scientific claims like does a non-physical soul exist or is the mind the product of the brain or of this hypothetical, non-physical soul, these questions cannot be settled simply by our deep-down sense of whether it's true or not. If we're seriously going to ask the question, does the soul actually exist in reality, we can't answer that question by going, hmm, you know, I've really thought about it and looked deep within myself, and I feel like I do have a soul, so that must be the answer. It's not the way it works. It's perilously close 
to the presuppositionalist claim that we all know God exists, even those of us who consciously deny it. Deep down inside, even if you don't admit it to yourselves, you know there's a God. I'm right because you know I'm right. Even if you say I'm wrong, deep down inside you know I'm right. These are not serious arguments by serious people. These, these are silly arguments by silly people who are pretending to be serious and are taken as serious by people who don't know any better. By people who are being deceived, either because they're allowing themselves to be deceived or because they have been duped. That's what this is. Third implication. No disembodied existence. No souls leaving the body after death. We cease to exist as conscious beings after we physically die. And again, this is essentially an appeal to consequences. Moreland makes some effort to establish that consciousness following physical death is a thing by citing near-death experiences, but that's a bad argument. For a start, there's a good reason they're called near-death experiences and not death experiences. People who have them aren't dead in the sense that most of us generally understand that term. They don't return to life. They are near death and they have vivid experiences that are probably not that different from dreams. They aren't evidence of anything beyond the physical. They don't demand a non-physical explanation in order to understand what they are and where they come from. They can be quite well understood and even reproduced under clinical conditions. Moreland is saying that if physicalism is true, then there's no soul, which means you don't get to go to heaven when you die, which means the Bible isn't true. Jesus didn't really die for your sins. And he might as well add to Strobel's Christian readers, oh, you wouldn't want to believe that, would you? It's an appeal to consequences. It's an emotional argument. Well, what about a positive case then? If physicalism isn't true, does Moreland have evidence for his assertion that consciousness is contained in the soul, not in the brain? Moreland refers to Penfield's work, and again, Penfield died in the 70s, stating that Penfield had stimulated the brains of many patients and found that, they, that he could cause them to make physical movements, but he could never cause them to have a particular belief or to make a particular choice. That's because, Moreland declares, those functions originate in the conscious self, not the brain. Or maybe Penfield just wasn't able to figure out how beliefs or choices occur in the brain in a way that enabled him to trigger them via electrical stimulus. As with Strobel's earlier citing of Penfield's work, it seems like a huge leap to say, well, Penfield couldn't force patients to make choices or have beliefs by electrically stimulating their brains. Therefore, that stuff must not happen in the brain at all. Are we really so sure that a scientist who did most of his important work in the 1950s understood the workings of the brain so completely that because he couldn't figure out how to elicit a particular response from the brain using his method, we can assume that the brain isn't capable of that response? Or is it more likely, or at least likely, that things like making choices and forming beliefs are more complex or at least different than moving arms or legs, and Penfield's techniques just weren't able to help him understand them during the time he was conducting his research. Strobel asks for evidence beyond the laboratory, as if he's given him laboratory evidence, but let's just pretend that he has. He says, what about other evidence? Is there evidence beyond the laboratory? And Moreland says that consciousness isn't a physical phenomenon because there are things true of his consciousness that aren't true of anything physical. For example, while he can have beliefs that can be either true or false, there's no such thing as a true or false brain state. He says, nothing in my brain is about anything. Your brain states aren't about anything, but some of my mental states are, so they're different. Furthermore, Moreland says that while a scientist might know more about what's happening in his brain than he does, no one could know more than he does about what is happening in his mind, because his mind is inner and private, 
Again, they are different. Again, Moreland conflates the mind and consciousness, which physicalists take to be products of the physical, with the physical matter and interactions that produce them. Just because you can meaningfully distinguish between the brain and the mind doesn't mean that one can't contain the other. Moreland's insistence that brain states don't mean anything or aren't about anything is odd, but also revealing of his thinking on this subject. He's saying that because brain states don't mean anything, because they aren't about anything, therefore nothing produced by those brain states could mean anything either. But isn't that like insisting that a complex phenomenon can only be understood in the simplest terms? I can describe and understand complex things in simple terms, therefore complexity doesn't exist? Is, does that make sense to anyone? The letters in an alphabet aren't about anything either. An A is an A. It represents particular sounds. It serves particular functions in our language. But it doesn't mean anything. It's not about anything. And yet you can use A along with all the other letters and symbols in our language, according to the rules of grammar devised to govern how those symbols ought to be used, and create words, sentences, paragraphs, stories, poems, articles, books, scripts, etc., that have an unlimited potential to mean all kinds of things in all kinds of ways to all kinds of people. Is it reasonable to say the King James Bible doesn't mean anything because it's made out of letters and letters aren't about anything? Or does saying that betray a fundamental misunderstanding of how simple components such as letters can be used to produce far more complex products that, while still able to be understood in the simplest possible terms, for instance, as a particular arrangement of letters, also demand to be understood at a more complex level. And you're really missing a lot of context if you look at a book and you describe it and understand it and think about it purely as an arbitrary arrangement of letters. And you completely miss out on the deeper, larger, more complex meaning that is produced by that particular arrangement of letters. That is the point I think Moreland refuses to get about the physicalist view of consciousness. The brain states he talks about not being about anything are like the letters in the alphabet of consciousness. Consciousness itself is what you get when the physical components of the brain are doing particular things. It's the product of a physical process. But that doesn't mean that it can only be understood in the simplest physical terms. The poetry of Emily Dickinson is a collection of letters placed in a particular sequence. It's also more than that. But the fact that it is more than that does not mean that it's supernatural. It doesn't mean that the letters are doing something impossible because they're simple, but the thing that they produced is complex. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Just as the brain states that produce consciousness are doing what they're supposed to do. Strobel asks Moreland what makes him think the soul is real. Moreland replies with more of the, ah, oh, we just know it argument. He says, we know that we are beings who are not merely the same thing as our conscious life or our physical life. We just know this deep down inside. We're all aware of this. And he gives the example of a woman, the sister of a former student of his, who had an accident and lost much of her memory. But despite losing her memory, Moreland says, she remained the same person all along. She didn't have the same memories or even the same personality, but she was still the same person. She did not become a completely different person. And all that proves is how complex our concept of personhood is. It doesn't prove that personhood is based on something immutable and eternal and non-physical. It could also be that personhood is based on numerous factors, none of which are immutable, and that our sense of ourselves and our identity is far more tenuous and contingent than most of us would like to think. Also, it doesn't really prove anything because the concept of a person is a constructed concept, and it's been constructed 
with the assumption that our personal identities consist of more than our memories and our personalities, that even if our memories or our behavior were to radically change, we would still be the same person we always were. That doesn't prove anything about the existence of a soul. It's just how we've evolved socially and emotionally and mentally to define and think of ourselves. We define personhood as consisting of more than our memories or our personality and still not have souls. A soul is not necessary for a person to mean what it means when we say person. And by the way, having said all of that, people are free to disagree with that reckoning of person. And some people do. There have been many cases where a person has suffered a traumatic brain injury and experienced dramatic behavioral changes, dramatic memory loss, dramatic personality changes. And people in their lives have started to regard them as a different person. They, they don't think of them as the same person in a sense. They say after the accident, she was a different person. And sometimes they're being figurative, but sometimes it's a lot more meaningful. Sometimes, you know what? They're so different that they really aren't the same person that they used to be. And yes, there are a lot of different senses in which you can say the word person and mean it. There are a lot of different forms of that concept. There are a lot of philosophical questions underlying this issue. It's very, very complicated. And my whole point is none of it requires the existence of a soul. Whether you think that personhood is rooted in memories and experience and self-identity and personality, or you think that a person can undergo a change and become a completely different person. It, it, none of that requires that a soul exists. None of that negates the existence of a soul either. But to act like, well, you know, even if you lose your memory, you're still the same person. Even if I agree with you, that doesn't mean that we have to have a soul. That's not the way it works. Finally, Strobel asks Moreland about artificial intelligence. And Moreland says, quote, Look, we have to remember that computers have artificial intelligence, not intelligence. And there's a huge difference. There's no what it's like to be a computer. A computer has no insides, no awareness, no first-person point of view, no insights into problems. A computer doesn't think, you know what? I now see what this multiplication problem is really like. But... On what basis should we conclude that a computer will never be able to think that? Look, if you want to say that true artificial intelligence is still a long way off, that despite the advances in computer technology we've seen over the last few decades, we're still nowhere near the level of sophistication necessary for true artificial intelligence and consciousness, I'll buy that. Perhaps people like Ray Kurzweil are way too optimistic as far as how soon that will happen. I have no problem believing that. But what says that it'll never, ever happen? Moreland just declares, well, computers can't do that. And he seems to believe that computers will never be able to do that. And I know the reason he believes this is because to him, consciousness is a magical thing that was gifted to us by God, and therefore no artificially created entity could ever have it. But he's also pretending to have valid scientific and philosophical reasons to believe this. And I'm just not seeing them. You want to say that computers aren't advanced enough to be truly intelligent? Fine. You want to say it could be a long, long time until that happens? You want to point out particular technological obstacles that need to be overcome before that happens, or even explain why it may be difficult or perhaps even impossible to overcome those obstacles? Great, go for it. That sounds fascinating and a completely valid scientific and philosophical exercise. But Moreland doesn't do that. He just says computers will never be able to do that, as though it's a logical impossibility. Well, Moreland and Strobel go on for a bit to discuss other topics like how evolution could account for consciousness, and uh, Strobel asks him, how could consciousness originate from mere matter? Boy, that's not a loaded question, is it? How could Don Quixote originate from mere letters? Is a similar question with a roughly similar answer, I think. Then they discuss how the mind emerges from physical material. Moreland mentions panpsychism, which is the belief that consciousness is a universal feature of all things. Or in other words, we live in a world of minds. <laughs> 
and he mentions panpsychism as though it is a necessary consequence of physicalism, when that is not the case. Panpsychism is a very old idea. People were talking about it and, and, and exploring it and questioning it and uh, thinking that that might be the way things are back in ancient Greece, and a lot of people still talk about it and believe it in certain ways today, but it is not necessary to believe that everything is conscious or potentially conscious in order to believe that consciousness is a physical phenomenon. Consciousness does not have to be a universal or inherent feature of everything in order to explain how we are conscious. And they talk about the fact that according to Moreland, there will never ever be a scientific explanation for mind and consciousness. That is a direct quote from J.P. Moreland. There will never ever be a scientific explanation for mind and consciousness. Moreland says that the mind will not be explained by science because unlike physical phenomena, the mind is not something that had to happen. Therefore, it can't be explained by understanding its underlying causes. How does he know that? I keep asking that question. He keeps just sort of saying these things like he's dropping some serious wisdom on you. He's just explaining with unassailable logic. Well, you see, the mind didn't have to happen. Therefore, there can be no scientific explanation. He doesn't explain how he knows that. Perhaps consciousness is a necessary and inevitable result of a brain as complex as ours. How does he know that isn't the case? How the hell is he so sure, so sure that he's able to say with a straight face and all the clueless confidence of an apologist that science will never ever explain consciousness? Ah, but I just answered my own question. The clueless confidence of an apologist who already decided what the answer would be before he even started researching the question. That's how. Sort of the same way that Lee Strobel went about writing this book. J.P. Moreland is to science as Lee Strobel is to legitimate journalism. Anyway, that's it. That's all we're going to cover for chapter 10. I will be back in the next video to cover chapter 11, the cumulative case for a creator, and that will be the last video of this series, and it will be the last Atheist Reads video I do, period. That's it, folks. We're almost done. And I have to tell you, even though there is some bittersweetness, um, overall, I'm looking forward to it. So I hope you will join me next time for the final An Atheist Reads videos. We'll wrap up the case for a creator. Thank you, as always, for joining me for this. Thank you for your questions and comments. If you have something to say in response to something I have had to say in this video, whether you are a Christian or an atheist or some other variety of believer or non-believer, please do leave a comment on this video and let me know what your thoughts are. If you enjoy this video and you enjoy the other videos that I do on this channel, please consider helping me to continue making them and to make more of them by becoming a supporter of this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron for as little as $1 a month. And those $1 a month pledges really help me out. But if you can afford it and you think I'm worth it and you pledge $5 a month or higher, you can take advantage of some extra perks built into the Patreon campaign, including getting sneak peeks at scripts and uh, patron-only advantages, getting to ask questions for my Ask Away live streams that I make sure to answer so that uh, you won't have your question ignored or missed out, and just other things for patrons and um, other benefits for higher level patrons as well. So if, if, you, if you dig what I do uh, and you want to help me and you want to support it, patreon.com slash Steve Shives. I really, really appreciate all of you for your attention and your support, whether you're patrons or not. And I'll see you next time.